Hello everyone, this is Angelo Corsaro, and today I'm very excited to uh, go through this web webcast, uh, the webcast launching OpenSlice Cash. This technology that will surely redefine you know, what people can expect from caching technologies and really you know, how ta caching technology are really thought and, and where they're applicable. So I'm OpenSlice EDS Product Strategy and Marketing Manager, and uh, with this new launch I'll be also covering the strategy and the marketing for OpenSlice Cash. But let's get started with the uh, agenda for today. So at first, I would like to uh, go through the rationale of why do we need caching. So which application domain needs caching the most, what are the use cases, what are the problem it solves, and so on. Then, once we are done with that and happy with it, um, I will go through covering some of the uh, key concepts behind OpenSplice Cache. So we will see uh, what provides you and, uh, and how it does it and why it's so unique. And then we will see and try to conclude. So let's start off with, with the challenges and the motivations. So why do we need caching today? Um, let's start off with a system that is uh, quite uh, popular and typical in, in uh, IT systems, which is a three-tier architecture or a three-tier system. So one of the trends that is being um, experienced by this system is that the number of clients that they have to deal with is growing typically exponentially due to the increased adoption of, let's say, eStar, where eStar are e-services typically available through the web. Now, taking alone the increase of customer leads to an increase of traffic uh, to your Atritier system, which then leads in increasing uh, needs in, in performing typically, um, um, in executing your services, which leads in more pressure on your database, okay? Now, at the same time, uh, what is happening is that uh, along with increasing clients, also the data that is available in the data tier is increasing. Why? Because there is far more data that is being digitalized, far more services being offered, and, uh, and thus that, you know, that there is one force pushing from the top, which are the client, but also from the bottom, the amount of data available is increasing. So what is the problem here? The problem is that although we can scale out the logic tier by adding relatively cheap hardware, um, and scale, let's say, linearly in terms of, uh, again, business logic execution time and, and scalability, we can't easily scale out the data tier. But if, or at least if we try, uh, then um, either we end up uh, uh, hitting a bottleneck real quickly if we take you know, the typical database route, or we end up um, you know, spending lots of money real quickly. So the relevance of, of this, you know, this issue is typically key and needs to be properly solved in all of those um, companies and, uh, and innovators that are trying to apply parallel such as software services or cloud computing, trying to implement next generation extreme transaction processing, or even just trying to uh, you know, reach the next level of performance in, in their uh, web architecture domain. And uh, we consider sense and response system. These are systems in which typically you have to deal with with the, the real world, so you have to sense something that is in the real world, understand what is happening, and react. Um, the picture uh, evoke uh, some sort of, let's say, military scenario, but there are several different application domains also in the civil world. So one of the key problems that you have in this sense and response scenarios is that you have to, uh, again, identify what is the state of the system and react. Uh, so there is this concept of a state that needs to be accessible by several different parties. And the typical approach are either to store this state on a database or replicate it wherever is needed. Now, the first approach, uh, meaning storing this data in a database, leads to inevitable bottlenecks because, again, you have this centralized or replicated database uh, which just won't scale. But the other approach, which is making all the data that is needed um, where is needed available, okay, might lead, if not properly implemented, to excessive resource usage or resource waste. So this problem is typically, belongs typically to the domain of C2 and C4 system, air traffic control and management, but as well as electronics and the more typical uh, distributed control systems. Now, if we move yet to another uh, application landscape and we focus for one moment on high performance computing, here we also have a couple of problems that typically we have to deal with, especially when we are trying to implement high performance computing solution with, let's say, cost hardware, so maintaining our cost, uh, let's say, reasonable. So one of the issues and the challenges that we have in this domain is that of dealing with huge amount of data, and specifically data that just can't fit on the main memory of a single machine or a single node. Um, 
So we need to be able to deal with it somewhat and make sure that we can still access this data with very good performance. And uh, it, ideally, we would be we would like to be smart and, in a sense, try to hide the fact that our main memory can't store all the data that we need, because perhaps there is some data uh, that we need at any point in time. And although all the data we need is more than our main memory, you know, I can just do my work by having part of the data in my memory at any point in time and being smart on how I do that. Another possibility is that, um, again, um, maybe you, you might be able to recompute some of this data, but, uh, but again, uh, you would be trading CPU cycles, which for a scientific application are very important uh, with respect to a smart way of managing your, your data. Um, notice that even in this case, accessing all the data from a centralized data server doesn't scale or, again, gets very expensive because you have to get into very sophisticated um, hardware data grid architecture, which are typically too expensive and, and can become a single point of failure for your architecture and so on. So this problem is typically a pain point for financial services as well as for, for companies that are involved, let's say, in uh, um, complex simulations and so on. And um, well, there are several examples we could make, but just to make the, the things a bit more concrete, um, and uh, you know, not, try not to be trivial since every day today is speaking about uh, uh, auto trading and so on. Let's make an example with risk management. So if you were building or you have a risk management application, then you know that in those applications there are a lot of financial instruments uh, that you have to um, typically take into account when uh, uh, assessing the risk. Now this financial instrument or the number of financial instruments in a typical risk management application easily exceed the amount of memory that you have on, uh, on your uh, workstation or on the workstation that make uh, the risk management system. Uh, the good news is that uh, at any point in time, you, know, you can just try to access and store a portion of those instruments on your machine. And the other aspect is that if they are not there, you can recompute them. So there are systems in which they try to recompute each time, but again, uh, because this is a not, in, in their perspective, a non necessary latency critical system, but still computing a complicated uh, financial instrument can take several minutes, and so that's not necessarily a good approach. So as we will see, the approach, again, is try to be smarter on how you manage your data. So what is the key idea for, for addressing uh, these problems and solving these challenges? Well, the key idea uh, is pretty simple, and uh, um, the basic, basically, uh, it boils down to uh, keeping the data close to where it's needed, or cache the data close to where it's needed, and keep it there for as long as it's needed, or uh, as long as you can. Now, the principle is very simple, so why should we should ask ourselves, why does this principle uh, work? And it works because of the so-called locality of references. The locality of references was empirically proved um, in, the, in the late 50s, and essentially says that an application tends to reuse data they've recently used. Typically, there are two important aspects of locality of reference, one which has to do with the temporal locality and the other which has to do with the spatial locality. The temporal locality predicates that if you have accessed that other item recently, then it's highly likely that you're going to access it in the near future. Well, the spatial locality predicates that if you have accessed a data item that uh, is somewhere, then you're going to access pretty soon another data item that is physically proximate or physically close to that data item. So this principle uh, of caching and uh, locality has been applied very successfully to caches, and in fact, and to other caches. In fact, in this picture, you see uh, a microprocessor, the two level, two level of caching and main memory, and today, honestly, we, we wouldn't be able to, to have the performance we typically can expect from our, our processor uh, without uh, a memory hierarchy such as those implemented in the, um, in the hardware cache. Now, a software cache essentially extends the concept of, of data caching uh, to a distributed system and implements something that very much looks like an hardware cache in software. 